Pilate was only 87 hours. There were amazing acts of bravery in the Blitz. It was a battle of uh, an unarmed civilian population against an enemy that they could not hurt. And it probably was Britain's finest hour. But this is not the whole picture. It's an unbalanced one, which grew from that what was written at the time. And to redress the balance, it is necessary to examine the accuracy of the reporting of the Battle of Britain, and even more important, to see what was not reported at all. The first point to make is that by far the biggest volume of reporting on the Battle of Britain is from came from American war correspondents. There were 120 top reporters from the United States covering the story. Their communications were good. They had the space in their newspapers, the time on their radio networks, and the British Ministry of Information did everything in its power to help them. By contrast, with the possible exception of Ritchie Calder, later Lord Ritchie Calder, and his paper, The Daily Herald, British war correspondents were slow to see the Blitz as more than a running disaster story. To be fair, they lacked space, and the censor would not allow them to report the one fact every reader wanted to know. What exactly got hit in last night's raid? To a man, the American correspondents were pro-British. When we saw the indisputable danger to the United States if England were occupied by the enemy, wrote Mary Welsh of Time and Life, and we cabled our views as plainly as British censorship then permitted, this pro-British sentiment naturally colored American reporting, and it prevented most correspondents from giving readers a balanced view. To begin with, Britain was not the underdog. The odds were about even. Germans attacked Britain with 702 single-seater and 261 heavy fighters, a total of 963. They had 1,000 long-range bombers and about 300 dive bombers. RAF Fighter Command at this time had a tactical strength of 666 aircraft, plus nearly 750 grounded temporarily for repairs or held in reserve, a total of 1,416. True, the RAF was seriously short of trained pilots, but British aircraft production was expanding on a growing base while German production was geared to short wars during which there would be bursts of intensive economic effort followed by periods of recuperation. Germany believed she could have guns and butter. In 1944, she was still producing domestic refrigerators. Since most of the fighting was over British soil, German pilots and planes shot down were irretrievably lost, British pilots might survive, and their planes could ev often be salvaged. The odds were roughly even, yet though throughout the battle, the RAF regularly lost more fighters than the Luftwaffe. It was German bombers that swelled the British score, and to break even, the RAF had to shoot down a great many of them. This was made possible not by brilliant British improvisation, but by radio direction finding, later called radar, stations which Britain had decided to start building four years before the outbreak of the war. So much for the lack of preparation. Throughout the, Brittle, the Battle of Britain, radar enabled the RAF to know when the Germans were coming and approximately where, a major factor in its victory. The young pilots of the Hurricanes, the RAF's principal weapon, not, as legend would have it, the Spitfighters, were under no illusion about the glamour of their task, and many found Churchill's rhetoric, Knights of the Round Table, Crusaders who grin when they fight, embarrassing. Air combat in the Battle of Britain was a matter of calculating apparently improbable coincidence of small pieces of machinery in very large air spaces, with the aim at placing one group of men in a position to shoot another group of men in the back with as little risk possible to themselves. There was nothing glamorous in the theory and nothing glamorous in the practice. The Germans fired on British pilots floating helplessly beneath their parachutes because they could, 
after all, be back in battle the same afternoon downing, shooting down Germans. The RAF, equally calculating, had no compunction about destroying a Heinkel 59 seaplane with civilian markings as it was engaged in rescuing German pilots floating in the channel, or another Heinkel 59 marked with the Red Cross. True, Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding forbade British pilots to shoot at Germans who parachuted to safety over Britain since it was necessary to wait only a few seconds for them to be captured, but the British pilots interpreted this order as allowing them to give Germans all they had while he was still struggling out of his cockpit. There was nothing to stop the home guard from blazing away at German. If his parachute dropped within range, Flight Lieutenant J.B. Nicholson, the only RAF fighter pilot to win a Victoria Cross, was wounded in this manner when the Home Guard mistook him for a German. As far as the daily tally of comparative losses was concerned, the correspondents had little choice but to accept the figures in official communiques, and these turned out to be hopelessly wrong, and, as the pilots themselves knew, exaggerated to maintain civilian morale. On September 9th, for existence, the Times, in a long story about a raid on London two days earlier, said that 107 German planes had been shot down. In fact, the figure was 41. On September 15th, the Air Ministry announced 185 planes destroyed. The greatest day in the whole battle. 185 down and we're still batting, the billboard said. The real German loss was only 60. The Air Ministry's total for the period July 10 to Jul October 31, 1940, was 2,698. Actually, the Germans lost 1,733. At the end of the war, the Air Ministry admitted, with a touch of British humor, that it had exaggerated its score by only 55%, whereas the Germans had done so by 224%. Could a conscientious correspondent have checked the official count? It's hard to see how. O.D. Gallagher, who raced round Kent in a ten-hand Pontiac for the Daily Express, has said, You watched a dogfight? You saw a spurt of smoke, and it grew, and one aircraft began to fall, and it was nose first, buried in the earth below in two minutes. How could you hope to know where it came down? I have been able to discover only one correspondent who at least tried to check the Air Ministry's figures. Barry Cornwell, the Southeastern Regional Press and Liaison Officer for the Ministry of Information, used to shepherd neutral war correspondents around the defense area, that part of Southeast Coast where neutral correspondents were allowed to go if accompanied by a ministry official. One day, Gottfried Keller, president of the Foreign Press Association in London, turned up and announced he planned to check the British score. The official communique claimed that the RAF had shot down 26 German planes the previous day. Keller thought that this was exaggerated. I want to see the wrecks, he said, and count them myself. Cornwell had been told that nothing was too much trouble for a neutral war correspondent, so off they went, chasing all over Kent, Sussex, and Surrey, climbing fences and tramping through woods until the count reached fourteen. By this time they were both exhausted, and Keller cried a halt. That's enough, I believe you. But the majority of the correspondents were prepared to accept British figures without question without giving their readers any warning that, although official, the daily tally might be inflated. The reporting of the Blitz was some, much the same. The, tone, the tenor of the American and Commonwealth correspondence dispatches was one of bravery, fortitude, determination, all true, but far from the whole picture. There is evidence that not everyone in Britain at that time shared Churchill's determination to fight to the last, the Duke of Windsor was appointed Governor of the Bahamas. The gold reserves of the Bank of England were shipped off to Ottawa. The Minister of Information, Alfred Duff Cooper, sent his son, John Julius, to Canada, 
and only Churchill's intervention prevented the departure of his great niece, Sally Churchill, to the United States. Parents who could afford to do so started shipping their families to safety in America or the Commonwealth. In June, July, and August of 1940, over 6,000 children took part in this exodus of the rich. The Swedish minister in London told Stockholm that some MPs were in favor of an early peace with Hitler, and the British ambassador in Washington, Lord Lothian, argued that nothing should be said that might close the door to negotiations. The working class began to feel, with some close justification, that the rich had plans to get out while the going was good. And additionally, a lot of people in London sent their children to northern England and other um, rural areas. Churchill was obsessed with getting America into the war. He tried to frighten Roosevelt with the prospect of an early German victory. He searched for an outrage, such as the sinking of the Lusitania in the First World War, that would arouse American opinion. German bombing of British civilians might well achieve this, but for the weeks it looked like Germans had no intention of being so obliging. The Luftwaffe's job was to destroy the RAF, and apart from the bombing of the aircraft industry's scattered factories, this brief did not include the bombing of civilian areas. Then, on the night of August 24th to 25th, German bombers made a crucial mistake. Their target was the oil storage depot at Thames Haven. Their bombs fell, instead, on the city and parts of East End of London. The German crews were punished for this error by being posted to infantry regiments, so it's reasonable to conclude that the raid was not intended as the first stage of a campaign against civilians. But Churchill's immediate reaction was to order the RAF to carry out, on August 5th, a reprisal raid on Berlin, despite unanimous advice of the RAF chiefs of staff not to do so. The Times on August 28th described this raid not as a reprisal, but as an attack on, quote, clearly defined military objectives, which had been selected a long time before, end quote. A day earlier, the Times published a report of the raid written by one of the pilots, in which he described finding a gap in the clouds over Berlin, locating one of those clearly defined military objectives and bombing it. But this report does not tally with the official account written by squadron leader Russell J. Oxley, who led the raid. Unable to identify his target, Oxley made a crucial decision. I could have brought my bombs back, of course, but I didn't. I left them in Berlin. London was bombed on August 24th, Berlin on August 25th. And these two feudal raids were the shoddy origins of the Blitz. Once it had started, it was hard to cry a halt. The Luftwaffe began bombing British cities, the RAF German ones, to little strategic end. A survey in August 41 showed that one-third of the RAF bombers sent over Germany failed to attack the target, and only a third got of the rest got within five miles of it. In these raids, more British airmen were killed than German civilians. Equally, Britain's anti-aircraft defensive in their early days killed more Londoners than German airmen. Naturally, none of this was published at the time, but one American correspondent, Raymond Daniel of the New York Times, wrote of his share of the finest hour copy, took a more objective approach, a, a more obje objective view of the bombing when he returned to the United States in March 1941. The futility of it all was depressing at times. It was a simple cockney who reduced the whole thing to an ultimate absurdity for me one night. It's a crazy war, governor, he said. I don't see why Jerry doesn't bomb Berlin and let the RAF take care of London. We'd both save petrol and be none the worse. The whole story of what happened as Berlin shook to the Luftwaffe's pounding was, of course, not written in British newspapers. If a correspondent had tried to write it, the censor would have not passed it. Several British correspondents wrote more freely and objectively in books that were rushed to publication in late 1941. 
For example, The Lessons of London by Richie Calder and Women and Children Last by Hilda Merchant. Censorship of books was not as stringent as of newspapers, and also the worst appeared to be over by then. American and Commonwealth newspapers concentrated on the courage and self-sacrifice, the cheerfulness, the Britain can take it side to the story, probably best summed up in the song Mr. Brown of London Town. This is the version of the Blitz that survived, and it has preferred and it's preferred to the other side, not reported at the time and painful to admit since. The Blitz was not the great social leveler. The protection of a Londoner got from German bombs depended on how much money he had. When the sirens sounded, the residents of Dorster went down to their basement, where a neat row of cots, some labeled with their owners' names, offered a safe refuge and even the possibility of sleep. All night shelter was offered as part of the service at most expensive West End restaurants. In the East End, however, thousands crowded into stifling, unsanitary shelters. Yielding to public pressure, the authorities allowed underground stations to be used, but many of these became terrible slums, foul with the smell of urine, excrement, excrement sweat, carbolic, and unwashed bodies. Lice and fleas flourished in justifying some, to some extent the governor's, government's fears about deep shelter mentality. Some people stayed down for weeks on end, while others liked it so much they continued bedding down there long after the blitz was over. The feeling that we're all in this together was not unanimous. When the Café de Paris was hit in March 1941, Thieves took rings from the fingers of the dead and wounded. Auxiliary fire service men appeared before the courts on looting charges. When the damaged houses were unattended, often because their owners were in the hospital with bomb injuries, looters stole the best furniture. The organization was not superb. When Liverpool was hit, some groups of firefighting parties had no equipment at all. Others had pumps but no vehicles to tow them. When the government did send vehicles, many turned out to be unroadworthy. Warehouses burned to the ground because there was no water for firefighting in a city situated along the Great River. The people could not always take it. When Coventry was badly bombed, Hilda Marchant of the Daily Express said the city was stricken, but keeps its courage and sanity. In fact, the German attack created panic. Thousands fled from the town in an unorganized route. The army wanted to impose martial law, and an official report described the general mood by repeating what a survival said, Coventry's finished. The Times spoke of the butchery at Coventry, wanton slaughter by a people pretending to be civilized who, it would seem, kill mostly for the joy of destroying. Coventry was actually a legitimate military target, one of two, one of the keys to Britain's British war effort, and the German bombers damaged 21 important factories, including the Standard Motor Company, the Coventry Radiator and Press Company, company the British Piston Ring Company, the Daimler Motor Works, and the Elvis Aero Engine Factory. Here, tools and mortars were made for British aircraft, the German A. P.K. reporter who flew with the Luftwaffe on the attack quite accurately told his readers the fact that the cathedral was hit and the industrial production in Coventry rose after the attack are two indictments of bombing as a weapon of war. Yet, instead, Coventry has gone down in history as a monument to German frightfulness. Some British and some American war correspondents did their best to show all sides of Britain under siege. Richie Calder, in cold, angry terms, reported civil defense failures in East End, as well as confusion, overlapping and buck-passing in the various ministries. Hilda Marchant spent days and nights in communal shelters and wrote about the appalling conditions. For their efforts, ministers accused them of giving comfort the enemy. But, in general, few correspondents or newspaper owners were prepared to risk suppression by defying the censor. So the dropping of parachute 
Mines was kept out of the press for the duration of the civil war of the war. The names and localities of damaged buildings were not mentioned until twenty eight days after the raid. All references to raids on factories were avoided. No casualty lists were published, and newsreels that showed the worst were censored. There were no reports of unexpected bombs, no suggestion of panic or chaos anywhere, and anything that might create alarm or despondency was avoided. The so-called Battle of the Atlantic, for example, a continuous struggle to prevent the Germans from starving Britain in the submission, which only really ended when the war did, was reported in terms of report heroic endeavor. endeavor. <laughs> it was indeed this, as the deaths of some 30,000 British merchant seamen, volunteers at nine pounds a month and two shillings and six pence a day, danger money, so eloquently attest. But the crucial information, the rate at which British ships bringing supplies across the Atlantic were being sunk by German submarines was suppressed on an order from Churchill on April 14, 1941. Ed Murrow complained bitterly in a broadcast in May, The curious thing about the Battle of the Atlantic is that no one knows anything about it. No information, not even general information concerning the sinking of American supplies is permitted to be revealed. Efforts by official American representatives to secure the release of information have been unavailing. Nothing can be said either to the Americans or the British public about the battle which, we are told, will determine the destinies of free men for centuries. The fact that Murrow was able to get this criticism past the censor shows that American correspondents were given a freer hand in their, than their British colleagues. Murrow and others made good use of this. In another broadcast, Murrow told Americans that the old Britain was dying and that ordinary people were asking awkward questions. Why must there be 800,000 unemployed when we need shelters? Why are new buildings being constructed when the need is that wreckage of bombed buildings be removed from the streets? What shall we do with victory when it is won? Drew Middleton wrote in November 1940, a story about Britain that was a contradiction of the line of Ministry of Information was taking at the time. What Middleton has described as the come on Hitler we're ready stuff. And in March 1941, he sent home a dispatch saying that the British might trust Churchill to get them through the war, but that there were plenty of opposition MPs and members of his own party who wanted to get rid of him as soon as possible. We become aware of the enormous propaganda machine pumping out the government view, Middleton has said, and the reaction in my case was to take a harder line. So it was not all a period of glory. Churchillian rhetoric, J.B. Priestley's cozy radio chats about the war aims in post-war Britain, the heroism of ordinary Englishmen, all transmitted by the correspondents to an American audience that gobbled it up and asked for more. And why not? asked Malcolm Muggeridge. It was all true, all heroic, all forever memorable. By the same token, all false, all squalid, all eminently forgettable. The heroism no more than indifference, Churchillian rhetoric as empty as Lawrence Olivia, pounding out Henry V's peroration before Agincourt, Priestley's down-to-earth good sense of the purest fantasy. And that is the end of that in four parts. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please hit like and subscribe. It helps me out um, so that someday I can upload these live and they won't have to be chopped up like this. Um, and thank you.